In 2016, after 12 years of campaigning and half a million pounds raised, the UK's first ever statue of a named black woman was unveiled in London. At the time, people said that Mary Seacole was a nursing pioneer whose rightful place in history alongside Florence Nightingale had been erased because of the colour of her skin. Other people said no, Florence Nightingale was way more important, Mary didn't deserve a statue and this was just political correctness. For me, my reaction was more like, Mary, who? Seriously though, it turns out that for the past 15 years or so, British children have been learning about Mary Seacole in primary school. But for baby boomers, Generation Xs and younger millennials like myself, we'd never even heard of her. I'm Luke Pierce, and this is the Radical History Channel. And in this video, we're going to talk about who was Mary Seacole? Why 140 years after her death did she have a statue built for her in London? Why the controversy? And why would we call her a radical anyway? All right, Mary Jane Grant was born, we think, in 1805 in Jamaica, back when it was a colony of Britain. She had a black Jamaican mother and a white Scottish army officer as a father, so she was born as a free person. Mary's autobiography implies that she very much saw herself as British and took pride in this alongside her black ancestry. Growing up, Mary really wanted to follow in her mother's footsteps who ran a hotel in Kingston and was a local healer. Many of the guests at the hotel were sick and injured and Mary and her mother tried to treat them with traditional remedies. Mary also used to practice treating her doll who apparently used to catch whatever the latest disease spreading around Kingston happened to be. Now the medicine Mary was learning from her mother wasn't exactly the type of medicine you'd expect in a hospital today, but there was still an emphasis on principles like hygiene, rest, nutrition and privacy way before these things became standard practice in nursing. Presumably their hotel was quite popular because Mary managed to afford at least two trips to London during her teenage years. When she was age 31, she then married a white man named Edwin Seacole. This wasn't happily ever after though. In 1843-44, to 44, Mary had a terrible year. First of all, the hotel in Kingston burnt down in a fire. Then her husband died, and after that, she lost her mother. Mary eventually travelled to Panama, where she tried to use her traditional techniques to help people suffering from cholera. She would charge rich people the full rate, but treat poorer people for free. Panama at the time was full of Americans passing through to California for the gold rush. Mary spied an opportunity and she set up what she called the British Hotel, which was really more of a restaurant. Mary's restaurant was popular, but she did have to deal with racism. She gives the example of politely declining the suggestion of an American man that she have her skin bleached. Mary returned to Jamaica to rebuild her mother's old hotel and care for British soldiers in the area, who as well as suffering from war injuries, often caught tropical diseases. It seems that Mary's treatments weren't necessarily helpful. She used mustard, lead and mercury to treat cholera patients and in her own autobiography said, I made some lamentable blunders and maybe lost patients which a little later I could have saved. I know I came across the other day some notes of cholera medicines which made me shudder. It wasn't until the 1960s that an effective cure for cholera was discovered and I couldn't find any evidence that Mary was particularly successful in this area. Whatever her good intentions to help, Mary was of course flawed. But let's remember that mainstream medicine didn't have a much better record in those days. European doctors would use mercury pills and patient bleeding to treat ailments and European medicine certainly had a poor record when it came to tropical diseases. The Crimean War broke out in October 1853. It pitted allies including Britain, France and Turkey against Russia and was basically over who would take land from the collapsing Ottoman Empire. It was one of history's many pointless wars and included the Charge of the Light Brigade, when British cavalry was mowed down by Russian guns, though it did lead poet laureate Alfred Lord Tennyson to write the memorable lines, theirs not to make reply, theirs not to reason why, theirs but to do and die. Mary Seacole heard about the Crimean War when she was in the Caribbean. She travelled first to London to deal with some investment she'd made in gold mining thanks to her experience in Panama. While in London, she decided she wanted to help by becoming a war nurse. One motivation may have been that she knew some of the soldiers who were being sent out to fight in the Crimea and she'd heard that there was a particular problem with soldiers dying from cholera. Mary applied to the war office to be an army nurse like Florence Nightingale, but she was refused. Now this rejection could have been because of the colour of her skin, but there are other possible explanations. Age, for example, Mary was 15 years older than Florence Nightingale, and it is believable that the War Office just dismissed her type of medicine. Rejection could even have been just because she was a bit late. Florence Nightingale and many other nurses had already been sent to the front line by the time Mary first applied. In her autobiography, Mary wrote, 
I am not for a single instant going to blame the authorities who would not listen to the offer of a motherly yellow woman to go to the Crimea and nurse her sons there, suffering from cholera, diarrhoea and a host of lesser ills. In my country, where people know our use, it would have been different, but here it was natural enough that they should laugh good-naturedly enough at my offer. Mary was persistent though, she applied a second time and this time got an interview with a colleague of Florence Nightingale's. She was rejected again and this time wondered about foul play. Was it possible that American prejudices against colour had some root here? Did these ladies shrink from accepting my aid because my blood flowed beneath a somewhat duskier skin than theirs? But this is where our story gets interesting. After that second rejection, Mary decided she was going to go to the Crimea anyway. She gathered up supplies and travelled to what was essentially a war zone, handing out tea to soldiers as soon as she arrived. This wasn't just about charity. She was a businesswoman selling food, clothing and commodities to men who missed the kind of luxuries they could get back home. If you're enjoying this video, please press like and subscribe. They're right down there in the corner. Look, look, down there. Mary's memoir says that she collected spare bits of metal and wood that were lying around to aid her in building, guess what, another hotel. The second British hotel opened in March 1855 and just like the one in Panama, its primary function was to give men a good meal and to sell useful items. Mary became very popular and it's easy to see why. Whenever I had a few leisure moments, I used to wash my hands, roll up my sleeves and roll out pastry. At Christmas time, her plum puddings and mince pies were apparently in high demand. William Russell, the world's first ever war correspondent for the Times newspaper in London, went to report on the war in the Crimea and became a big fan of Mary Seacole. He wrote that she used to go to the front line to help the wounded and comfort the dying. She provided tea but also other basic supplies like bandages and needles and thread. Soldiers called her Mother Seacole. They loved her and reports of her efforts basically made her a celebrity back in Britain. At the end of the Crimean War though, Mary's business dried up. She returned to London to face creditors demanding that she repaid loans and was then declared bankrupt. But Mary had friends. Former soldiers and allies helped raise awareness of her situation and in 1857 a fundraising gala was held in London in her honour with 80,000 people showing up. William Russell wrote, I trust that England will not forget one who nursed her sick, who sought out her wounded to aid and succour them, and who performed the last offices for some of her illustrious dead. Mary also released her autobiography, The Wonderful Adventures of Mrs. Seacole in Many Lands. It was the first published autobiography of a black woman in Britain and completely sold out. Mary was back in business. Mary died in 1881 in London, aged 76. She was then essentially forgotten about in the UK for over a hundred years, although she did have buildings named after her in Jamaica since the 1950s. Now there's been some criticism out there about Florence Nightingale being recognised for years while Mary Seacole was forgotten about. Other people say that recognising Mary Seacole undermines the work of Florence Nightingale. Nightingale went to nurse Crimean war soldiers at military hospitals in Turkey in definitely improved conditions. She's considered the founder of modern nursing. Because after her experiences in the Crimea, Nightingale established the first secular nursing school in the world at St Thomas's Hospital in London, and she certainly professionalised the whole discipline. Nightingale also has a whole load of other achievements to her name, like her research and being one of the first people to use things like pie charts to present statistical data more clearly, although plenty of school children don't seem particularly thankful for that. When you look at Mary Seacole's story, I think it's difficult to claim that she pioneered nursing, and it's true she didn't have training in medical hospitals. But then, neither did many of the nurses helping Florence Nightingale, and proper training didn't even exist before Nightingale set it up after the Crimean War. Mary Seacole's hotel was closer to the front line of operations in the Crimea. She was in there with the men who clearly appreciated her presence. And all that positive press coverage she got in her day surely tells us something about the impact of the first aid and moral support she provided. But wait a second, why do we even have to compare these two women, both of whom just wanted to bring some humanity to what was a terrible war? I mean, apart from helping in the Crimean War, they don't really have much in common, other than being women who were trying to make their way in the world. It seems strange that both pro-Mary people and pro-Florence people would make such a fuss about one supposedly overshadowing the other. Surely there's space in history for both of these women. They were operating at a time when medicine was way behind what it's become today. What mattered as much as anything in the Crimea was their humanitarianism, their presence and comfort to the weak during dark times. As to Mary's skin colour, 
There are a couple of references, but Mary doesn't seem to make a huge deal about prejudice in her memoir. We know though that women of colour used to face racism in that age, which only serves to make her achievements all the more remarkable. When I look at the story of Mary Seacole, the evidence and how she writes about herself, I don't immediately think nurse. What I see is a businesswoman, what we might today call an entrepreneur, whose initial offer of help was rejected, but who found a way to break through regardless. An adventurer who went from Jamaica to Panama, London to Sevastopol, traveling alone when that was highly unusual for a woman. A successful author who made her own money. A heroine who went to a war zone and tried to help through business and charity. A radical, because despite all of the obstacles of the age, she wouldn't accept the status quo and believed that she could make a change for the better. So for all of that, I think it's fair enough she got a statue. I hope you enjoyed watching this video about Mary Seacole. I certainly learned a lot looking into her history. If you're interested in hearing about more inspiring figures like Mary, then the only thing to do really is to subscribe to the Radical History channel. You can do this by pressing the red subscribe button below this video. You might want to give me a like at the same time. And I also recommend that you hit the notification bell and select notifications to all, which means that you'll hear about every one of the Radical History videos in future. Until next time, thanks Thanks for watching and see you soon.